Question. Should Seventh-day Adventist growth alarm evangelical Christians? Yes. 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 Oh, my work is done. <laughs> well, maybe not. Let's take a closer look. Considerations. Let's uh, take a look at the most recent world membership statistics. That is, as of December 31st, 2018. Notice total church membership. 21.4 million. Hmm. Total accessions, which means folks joining up in 2018. 1.38 million. Let's go further. And their mission to the world. Countries and areas where the Seventh-day Adventist Church's work is established. Now, the United Nations says that there are 235 countries and areas in the world. Out of that total, the Adventist Church is busy in 213. Pretty bad. Should we be alarmed? Language is used in publications and oral work. 557. Compare that with 188 for the Mormons. Just to give you a little context. Where are the Adventists? Well, as I said, nearly everywhere. And this is a map of their 15 General Conference World Divisions. Now, they use a lot of peculiar geographical designations in Adventism. They have missions, union missions, union conferences, mission fields, attached territories. It gets very confusing for someone like me who's just wants some basic numbers on who's where and what they're doing. But uh, we will be focusing on just six regions of the world, as you'll find out in a moment. Looking at SDA membership growth over half a century, we've got a pretty big swooping upward line there. Not, not so encouraging for people like you and me. Here's something else, courtesy of David Trim of uh, church headquarters. In the 54 years since 1964, over 37 million people have been, now that's an interesting way of putting it, have been <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist church members. But that's still too many. Many too many. And they claim that based on these statistics, if you average things out, every 23 seconds, somebody becomes a Seventh-day Adventist. Should we be alarmed? You decide. Now, I need to thank my colleague at the Centers for Apologetics Research, Tim Martin, in Pennsylvania, for his massive help in gathering these numbers and sorting them out. There would not be a presentation tonight without him. Let's look at Seventh-day Adventist world membership by region. I told you that I would be talking about six regions. We're talking about Africa, North America, South America, Asia, Oceania, and Europe. Now, as of 2007, Africa dominates, clearly, followed by North and South America. Okay, bear that in mind. Now let's compare with a decade later. Kaboom. There is an African explosion. An explosion. And stagnation. Look at this. In South America, Oceania, and Europe. Is this what you expected? Maybe not. But uh, as far as looking at these matters strategically... These numbers are extremely important. And here again, by the numbers, uh, Africa climbed from 5.3 million to 8.4 million, and so on. I don't think you need that much detail right now. Let's compare using the pie chart, though, because some people like pies better than bars. Uh, 2007, you see that big blue section of pie, Africa. Next biggest is North America, followed by Asia. And you can see that by 2017, which, by the way, is the last year for which we have country-by-country country specific statistics. That's why you're seeing these two numbers. Africa continues to grow. 
And in fact, if you look at it on a percentage basis, Africa has grown by 58%. What are the top 20 countries? Zambia is number one. Zambia, that giant landlocked country in southern Africa. It's followed closely by countries like Uganda and Rwanda, which, by the way, more than doubled in 10 years. They're just screaming hot. And we have to ask, why? The top 20 countries in Europe, Romania and Ukraine, are numbers one and two. Very interesting, I think. And then uh, you have uh, the Western European and Nordic countries mostly fighting over what remains. Almost all of them are going down in Europe. Almost all of them, except for France and Spain. Uh, they're doing terribly in Europe. Latin America. Adventism is dominated in Latin America by uh, three giant countries, Brazil, Mexico, and Peru. But there's a surprise with Peru. So hang on. Don't know if we have any Peruvians here tonight. Comparing now by growth. Look at Brazil grow. Mexico is also growing, even though it's one of the biggest Adventist countries in the world. Peru has shrunken by half. In other words, it's roughly 50% of what it used to be. And if you read the Adventist mission literature you, you, and statistical literature, you can see that they're, that they're trying to adjust from some bad reporting practices. Uh, I'm suspecting that this is what happened in Peru. But, because I can't imagine fully half of them just marching away. So that is a mystery yet to be solved. Sub-Saharan top 20 countries. Now, you know that Africa is basically Sahara with, you know, countries like Algeria and Egypt and, and Tunisia at the top. And then below the Sahara, you have just about everybody else. And in sub-Saharan Africa, Adventism is dominated by mostly English-speaking countries in East and Southern Africa. French-speaking countries, by and large, lose out. West African countries lose out. Now let's look at these numbers again. Again, you can see that Zambia just exploded, as did Uganda and Rwanda. Did I mention that out of the top 20 countries, Adventist countries in the world, 11 are in Africa? Sub-Saharan Africa ranked by percentage growth. Now, Sudan is number one, but that's because Sudan didn't have a whole lot of members, and so if they grow a lot, it, it kind of places them awkwardly next to big countries like Zambia. Uh, but uh, otherwise, Zambia, Uganda, and Rwanda more than doubled. Most of these are predominantly English-speaking nations, only three significant French-speaking countries in, uh, in the African top 20, and two Portuguese-speaking nations. And this is the wild thing to me. About one out of every 10 Africans lives in Nigeria. And for the Adventists, Nigeria is shrinking. Why? Again, this for me is a mystery that I would like to somehow solve. And to give you a longer view, this, uh, this slide is from the uh, Pew Research Center, Future of World Religions study, that appeared in 2015. And they're talking about where they expect religions to be and where religious people to dwell, uh, percentage-wise, in various parts of the world in the year 2050. And they estimate that in 2050, four out of 10 of all the world's Christians will live in Africa, which makes Africa the chief battleground for groups like Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Seventh-day Adventists, because these groups are predatory and parasitic. They feed off the church. Moving ahead, 
There it is. Four out of every 10 Christians in the world will live in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's been uh, predicted that uh, Uganda will probably, by about this time, have more Christians than all of uh, the Western European countries combined, as memory serves me. And it's just an itty-bitty country with an unnaturally large population, but still. Contrast. Let's look at Mormonism for a minute. That's quite a big swooping line for a half century. 1960 to 2010, Mormons grew from 1.7 million in 1960 to about 14 million in 2010. Let's compare these guys with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Notice the almost identical starting point there in the left-hand corner of the screen. The Jehovah's Witnesses way outperformed the Mormons in global growth, just astonishingly. And yes, last but not least, let's add the Adventists. Now, they start out behind the other two. And now they are on a path to meet and possibly surpass the Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, the trends, they concern me, as I suspect they concern you. And here's another way of viewing it. Mormons in bars. Not behind bars, just <laughs> in bars. Well, not that kind of bar either. Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses represented with colored rectangles. <laughs> and in red, the Seventh-day Adventists here. Uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting. The JWs overtake the Mormons, look at this, in about 1970 and never look back. The Adventists overtake the Mormons in about the year 2000. And the Mormons can't seem to match the momentum of either competitor. Despite their 65,000 full-time missionaries, understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church barely has any full-time missionaries or what is it? interdepartmental employees. They have funny names for almost everything in Adventism, don't they? And uh, yeah, they don't have a missionary force like the Mormons. They don't have a sort of every member a missionary situation like we have with the Jehovah's Witnesses, who are about six, seven million publishers. That's baptized witnesses who go door to door. Uh, some of those, a good number of those are pioneers who commit to a certain number of hours per month. No, the Seventh-day Adventists are growing really like gangbusters. And you have to say, how? Why? So, let's look at the Adventists' top 20 countries and compare that with the Jehovah's Witnesses. The um, Witnesses beat them in Brazil, but not by much. In the United States, JWs are king. And in a number of other places. But look at this in Europe. <laughs> look at Italy. The Jehovah's Witnesses versus the Adventists. Uh, we can see which group has more appeal. In interestingly, um, the United Kingdom is uh, one of the places where the, well, the Mormons are doing especially well and the Jehovah's Witnesses. And Mormonism, you can tell, Mormons rule the United States compared with the Adventists. And in fact, most, Mormonism is a hemisphere religion. Most Mormons are in North and South America and the Caribbean. Very little presence in Africa, Asia, and the rest of the world. They've kind of left those places for the Jehovah's Witnesses and Adventists to fight over. For as much as I've been able to make clear to you, let's provide a bit more context. Again, Mormons, 65,000 full-time missionaries, full-time convert-making missionaries. They're not planting crops. They're not, you know, doing marriage counseling. They're going door to door. They're, they're very unusual in this, and they're, 
exceptionally trained, especially in languages, and it's, it's quite an impressive achievement. And the Jehovah's Witnesses, of course, with over six million missionaries. And by the way, I mentioned over 500 languages for the Seventh-day Adventists. Go to the Jehovah's Witness website. They have over 1,000 languages on their website. No other organization, to my knowledge, is doing this. Uh, religious, commercial, governmental, they blow everybody else away. But still, the Adventists at half that are uh, pretty amazing. So how are the Adventists approaching this? Well, for one example, um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a plan to reach the world, called the Reach the World Plan. Uh, and what are those three winged beings uh, at the top? Uh, shooting down rays to the, uh, I don't know, it looks like a mosque, uh, some kind of squarish secular building, a church with a cross on top. Hmm, looks like a hut and some kind of pagoda. They had a strategic plan called Reach the World from 2015 to 2020, and this is 2020. Hasn't been for long, but it is. And Understand that this nicely presented plan, which I'll talk about in just a moment, is not the only plan that the Adventist church is pursuing because as this little spread suggests, here you have the logos of just 17 of the Adventist church's ongoing plans, projects, initiatives, what have you. It's ever, ever multiplying. It's kind of like a hydra, really. And again, this is proselytizing because you will never catch me calling what Adventists do to spread their message evangelism. And I would encourage you to adopt the same uh, posture if uh, your conscience allows it. Now, in addition to these 17, you have, for example, the Great Controversy Project, which started in 2011. And they claim that they put 142 million copies of the Great Controversy into the hands of people or into the eyeballs of people electronically and in print around the world. Uh, they, they at least met their goal with this. Uh, they now have a feature-length film. How many of you have seen Tell the World? Raise your hands. I'd like to see. Really? OK. Colleen has seen it. Um, <laughs> There's Q&A tomorrow, maybe, or during the podcast, you can tell them about it. I couldn't sit through it, but it's beautifully shot. It was done by the Australians. And it's, it's, it's about the origins of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Uh, it starts with William Miller, who's having uh, PTSD at the very start, because he you know, was in battles, and you know, it, it takes you through his life. Ellen White comes in, and of course, she's gorgeous. It's not nice of you to laugh. <laughs> but uh, th this is a movie that they've been using around the world. And in fact, uh, the producer, who's an Australian, said in words to this effect that, they, um, that the film very subtly introduces audiences to Adventist ideas like the investigative judgment and the Sabbath. So a lot of Seventh-day Adventist proselytizing is a stealth operation which many people in this room realize already, but maybe not everyone listening to the sound of my voice, courtesy of the internet. But the thing that I think the church is most excited about right now is something called total member involvement. And I talked about that at some length in 2017 when I gave a, an expanded version of, of uh, a kind of presentation along these lines. This is something that is heavily promoted. It's multifaceted. You know, the name is suggestive. Total member involvement. Uh, each one, reach one, lose none, disciple all is the motto. And it engages all kinds of aspects of uh, church work. Health expos and mega clinics. Voice of Prophecy Bible studies. Those deceptive glow proselytizing tracts. Revelation and Daniel seminars. Um, this is the, the effort that the church is boasting about when they talk about the 100,000 baptisms in Rwanda in the year 2016. And besides total member involvement, 
I should mention that the Seventh-day Adventist Church really seems to be quite serious about pushing into so-called unreached people groups in the 1040 window. Maybe they're running out of Protestants to, to work on. But we'll see what happens. But what is the message behind all of this massive missionary activity? I think you suspect. Now, see, here again, we have total member involvement. And the church is saying this is largely responsible for, at this time, 2017, topping 20 million members. An African scholar, I think this, this, this quote is gold, an African scholar in his uh, thesis at uh, the University of South Africa said, Adventist missionaries have never altered what they believe is their distinctive call. Namely, to preach Christ, Sabbath, and judgment to non-Christians, as well as Sabbath and judgment to Christians. Does that not resemble the, the Great Commission to you? Or is it just me? I'm not sure. That was uh, Jerome Ngabo who said that. But uh, he said it with good reason. So last weekend, Ted N.C. Wilson, General Conference President, was in Southern Africa. He went to Malawi, which is one of the church's biggest success stories in terms of comfort growth. And as I mentioned, I think earlier, Malawi is also a place where the church has the deepest historical missionary roots along with Zimbabwe and, and Zambia there in, uh, in Southern Africa. Uh, Wilson uh, was there to meet the nation's leaders. You know, he met with the President Mutarika. He met with the, the mayor of Lidongwe, rallying SDA church members in the national stadium. And what did he do? He he was promoting total member involvement to the president of Malawi. That's a very interesting thing to me. And uh, the president of the church's Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division, who, who followed Wilson around on all of his appointments, says, I can't remember a place where he spoke and didn't mention the three angels' messages. If we don't talk about it, who will? Good point. Uh, and if you read the, the Adventist missionary literature again and again, you will see references to the three angels' messages. Now, for folks at home who are not familiar with this, uh, for example, here is uh, Bruce Bauer, who is a, an Adventist professor of missions. From the very beginning, the Seventh-day Adventist church has had the goal to preach the three angels' messages to every nation, tribe, language, and people. Okay, that's what it's doing. Well, what are the three angels' messages? Again, for the folks at home. Uh, this is uh, derived from a few verses in Revelation 14. And I think it can best be summarized, the thrust of it, the essence of it, as being Sabbath-keeping, investigative judgment, remnant church, with you know, some other stuff thrown in. But uh, pretty much that's, Allegedly, what the three angels are talking about. This is the message to the world that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is so busy, 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 busy promoting under a variety of guises. Should we be alarmed? Now, just, just as a frame of reference, uh, I have uh, breaking news from 1999. Seventh-day Adventist church membership to triple in size by 2020, according to the Adventist News Network. Yes, they expected that by this year, there would be roughly 37 million Seventh-day Adventists in the world, as opposed to the 21 million in the current statistical support. Now, okay, so they've obviously fallen short far short of that expectation of 1999. But why? Again, let's look at this graphic. In the 54 years since 1964, 37, rounding, 37.6 million people have been members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Some of you know what's coming. 
But of these, and we laugh, but of these, 15 million have chosen to leave. The net loss rate is 40%. But wait, there's more. Again, more than 30 million people have been baptized since the 1960s, reported David Trim. Thank you. Nonetheless, the denomination's total membership is less than 18 million. So the question is, where are these 12 million people? Where are they? Who are they? This is, this is serious stuff. But really, what is the spiritual state of the more than 12 million men, women, and children around the world who have left? Does this alarm and concern you? Concern me that they didn't just sort of evaporate? Conclusion. Brothers and sisters, I think it is fair to say that in light of the data before us, compassion dictates that we, being the body of Christ around the world, mount a strong, sustained, and strategic response to the SDA missionary challenge. Don't just sit back and wring our hands. Don't just wish it were otherwise. I mean, we need to do something actually on an organized level, a very broad, organized level involving many, many people. And here's the triage aspect of it. We need to be equipping vulnerable believers to recognize and resist the serious errors of Adventism. I know that Life Assurance Ministries is doing this. Can you name three others who are intentionally doing so? Come see me afterwards, because I can't. And especially Christian leaders across sub-Saharan Africa. There's that word again, triage, triage, because this is where the wound is growing at the greatest speed, really, is in East and Southern Africa. And our organization has plans, and we are partnering with Life Assurance, and uh, I ask you to pray for this, while at the same time boldly speaking the truth and love to both Adventists and former Adventists who are still in spiritual captivity. So we kind of have three groups that we could be alarmed about, if you will. And we should give this very serious thought. Remembering always that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities and powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms, not just flesh and blood Adventists, whose work may alarm us, offend us, uh, provoke us, but they're not the real enemy. Instead, we are to put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, we may be able to stand our ground. Amen? And after we've done everything, to stand. Thank you.